Hello, everyone. Welcome to WOW Live, Word on Wednesdays Live. It is great to have you joining with me online this evening. We are continuing a topical study on which the Word of God speaks authoritatively, intentionally, and foundationally. The subject of origins, how everything began. To kind of springboard off of this past Sunday's sermon, tonight what I want to do is to begin looking with you at the biblical explanation for the rock layers we see around us and other features that, that are there, like canyons, mesas, fossils, and so forth. All these things that are evident today. How did they get there? Which is the better explanation? As you no doubt know by now, I believe that the Bible teaches about a global flood, a catastrophe that was universal in scope. The waters of the great flood covered the entire earth. Young earth creationists maintain that this global event totally restructured and revamped the surface of the planet, making radical changes to the appearance of things and the conditions of earth. Of course, this runs completely contrary to the uniformitarian view of slow and gradual processes creating everything. So then, what does the evidence we have available to us say? Which view? Catastrophic global destruction or gradual development over vast ages of time? Which view does the evidence we see best fit? If the rocks could talk, what would they tell us? Lining up with that idea, there's a familiar story in the life of Jesus. Uh, recall Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And as we look here at Luke chapter 19, verses 37 to 40, Luke reports this exchange taking place between the Pharisees and Jesus himself. Then, as he was now descent, drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the, of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees rebuked, called to him from the cloud, crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. If these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus is using uh, a device known as an anthropomorphism here, attributing to inanimate objects human characteristics. And in this case, we have stones that are crying out. Now, while stones may not literally cry out, except maybe the rolling stones or somebody, and they don't cry out nearly as much as they used to, uh, if, if stones don't literally cry out giving glory to God, I do believe that the stones all around us do give testimony to his greatness. In the course of these lessons in this series, I've probably talked more than I needed to about the modern uniformitarian view of how the features of our planet formed over long, slow, gradual processes, taking uh, reportedly millions and millions of years. And, and we've looked at the conflict that that idea raises when it comes to what the Bible says. So we've seen compromise views arise, like the gap theory and the day-age idea, contrived by Christians who felt this overwhelming need to find some sort of middle ground, uh, as though they were trying to accommodate uh, what modern scientists were saying, uh, but not necessarily what science would say. But consider this. What if there was an explanation based upon the biblical teaching of a global flood that would explain the geology and the topography of the earth. What if I could show you a model that fit both the Bible and also the evidence we see today, and I believe fits the evidence much better than does that uniformitarian long ages view that we've been discussing. If this were doable, to be able to show you something uh, of a model that, that fits the Bible, well then there would be no reason at all for any Christian to believe in vast amounts of time and long, slow, gradual processes. 
the predominant contemporary view offered by mainstream academics. We're going to take a look tonight at an idea, uh, begin to take a look at it anyway, that helps bring all of this together. Instead of gradual uniform processes over millions of years, we're instead going to consider the power of a global catastrophe like the biblical, biblical flood and one way how that may have happened. Some who have tried to compromise with the views of secular materialists have said that the flood was a local event and not global, but the Bible indicates otherwise. Let's begin by examining what the text of the Bible says for clues that show this flood covered the earth. Here's a view, or a verse rather, that I used in last Sunday's sermon. Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. In the, part, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Here we read about where the water for this great global flood came from. It wasn't just a big storm cloud coming through. Windows of heaven, it says, were opened. Also, it says, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. What exactly does that mean? The, these fountains of the great deep seem to imply that there was a subterranean source for water. Lots of water, all underground. The text says that all of these underground wells of water were opened up on a single day. Water pouring from the sky and water gushing from beneath the earth. Both provided the source for the floodwaters that ravaged the planet. And moving water, being the powerful force that it is, totally rearranged the appearance of the planet. Now, check out this passage. Genesis chapter 7, a little further down the chapter, verse 17 through 24. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life all that was on the dry land died so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground both man and cattle creeping thing and bird of the air they were destroyed from the earth only noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Water seeks its own level. If the highest mountains that were on earth at the time were covered by water, well, that clearly means the great flood covered the entire planet. Think about it in the terms of what Noah was instructed by God to do. If the flood was just local, if it was just contained within a valley region, well, all that Noah and his family would have had to do, or anybody else for that matter, would have been to move with whatever animals they had over the mountains and into the neighboring valley. There was no need for a big boat. Why then would the Bible say there was an ark? Why tell Noah to build an ark? And recall what the Bible says regarding the results of this great flood. So God destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground. Both man and cattle, creeping thing, birds of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. All living things in whose nostrils were the breath of life on the land died in the flood. In recording that the mountains were covered and that all land-based life was destroyed, the Bible clearly is teaching a universal flood. Those who teach the flood was just a local event do so 
because they consider this Genesis account to be more the words of men than what it actually is, the Word of God. When you read their arguments for the local flood view, you can clearly see that this is their very starting point. They believe that when we read words such as all the high hills were covered and all living things perished, it doesn't really mean all. Those were just words that were used to uh, exaggerate or, or, or broaden the story, to make the story more dramatic, to make it more of a, a good legend to tell. To counter that kind of thinking, I would refer you instead to the words of Jesus and what he said happened at the time of the great flood in Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He's equating those two events in some way. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and so did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now just think through what Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, is saying to his disciples there. Now, if Noah's flood was just local and was only affecting some people, well, then maybe Jesus' return will only be local and only affect some people. Does that even make sense? One common question, a question I posed last Sunday morning, which is meant as a criticism of the global, global flood idea, is this. If there really was a worldwide flood, well then, where did all the water go? But like I pointed out on Sunday, when you really look at the big blue marble that we call planet Earth, that's kind of a moot criticism. The globe is still mostly covered with water. But quite obviously, in our time at least, the land isn't. So what happened to the planet to cause all the water to pool, as it were, in certain locations, which we now call oceans and seas? Well, here's a passage from the book of Psalms, which might help you out. Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9. You who laid the foundations of the earth, so that it should not be moved forever. You who covered it with the deep, as with a garment. It's covered completely, okay? The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down to, into the valleys to the places which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Now, this passage in Psalm 104 describes the time of the flood. The waters went over the mountain. Again, evidence that the Bible says the great flood was universal. And, and the waters covered everything like a garment, right? And the waters went down into the valleys, into the places that you, God, had founded for them. Now, the Hebrew word that is translated uh, as founded there is yasad, a foundational thing, a yasad. Its root word, sod, has a link to the Latin word seder, which means to seat, okay? That Latin uh, word, interestingly enough, is the word from which we get sediment, as in sedimentary rocks. This is the road cut that you see at uh, Sidling Hill on Interstate 68. Wonderful perspective on this from the air, I would assume. Take a look at the the way those layers of rock are running they're they're uniform in the way they are curved notice from the left they come down from the left side of that rock face there and and and, and they begin to curve you can see it on about the third one from the top um, third or fourth one actually third one you can see see it there is where it begins and then as you go up, you can see the other ones. They're all curving. They're concentric. It almost looks like a close-up of a, of a uh, 
of a bowl or a dish or a, uh, maybe even a, a, a phonograph record. You have to ask your parents about that, what a phonograph record is. It's got the grooves and, and they all seem to run in, in curve. How do you curve rock? How do you curve rock like that? How does that happen? How, how would that take place? Uh, you, you know, it would make sense if, if the rock were soft, if it weren't really rock, but much more li like mud or clay or something, and then some force acted upon it to kind of squeeze it up into that kind of pattern, which means all those rock layers would have had to have been laid down at the same time, or roughly the same time, not one at a time over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Very interesting looking thing there. Yasad can be translated as appointed. Appointed, God appointed a specific place for those receding floodwaters to settle. He founded a place for them to go. Genesis 8, 1 through 5 says, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped. And the rain from earth was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So that's some explanation as to what was going on um, in the, the, the time of the flood to show us where the waters went a little bit and show us where they ultimately ended up. God preparing places for them, the water rising, the water receding, over the period of about a year and, and a month, something like that. Uh, maybe two months after, you know, a year and two months, somewhere in that range. I don't have the exact total, but it, it it's recorded in Scripture if you add up the numbers of days and that sort of thing. Recall that what we have been saying all along, that the uniformitarian notion of millions of years to form the rock layers and the other geologic features of our planet, recall that we've said that this is an assumption. It's not a scientific fact at all. It, it's pure speculation because it must be so. Science can't examine conclusively what it cannot directly observe. All right, like, like we did with the candle burning in the room uh, uh, experiment or illustration. Uh, you, you, you don't know when the candle started to burn, so you have no idea how tall it was when it began or how fast it's been burning. Therefore, all ideas, all the notions we've ever heard about origins, whether it comes from evolutionist or from creationist, all are speculations based upon assumptions that cannot be proven. In other words, there are certain limits, just like the, the water has limits that it cannot go and recover the earth. There are certain limits that science can never get to. Okay, I think that's important to understand, and it should be a humbling thing, but it often doesn't happen that way. Um, we're going to look at one man's ideas this evening uh, of how this global flood got started. And most significantly, we'll get some idea of the power unleashed by this global catastrophe. This is one man's theory, so we can't say with any authority that it happened exactly like this. And no one is saying that, not even Walt Brown, the man who devised what he calls his hydroplate theory. To begin our overview of Dr. Walt Brown's theory, consider with me how the pre-flood earth may have looked. Likely, all the landmass was one large supercontinent surrounded by water, uh, or water uh, within the continent like you see there. Genesis 1, verses 9 through 10, God says, uh, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. 
The mountains on the, that pre-flood earth were not as high as today, maybe 9,000 feet maximum. There, there were, may have been some inland lakes like we see here. We know that there were pre-flood rivers. It says so in Genesis 2.10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. So there were rivers. Slicing a quarter of the earth away, we can see the heated core of the earth. The granite crust is visible as a kind of grayish-white area right underneath the surface of our planet there. Let's go in for a closer look at that. The dark gray shaded area directly beneath that uh, whitish gray uh, granite crust, that dark gray area is the Earth's mantle. The mantle is made up of basalt. Basalt is an igneous rock, meaning it's formed from molten rock that cooled and crystallized. The lighter gray area that we see is that granite crust. Dr. Brown raises some interesting points about the formation of some of these earth layers, and I especially find his comments about this granite crust fascinating. In his book entitled, In the Beginning, on pages 112 and 113, he writes this, As children, most of us were taught that the early earth was molten. Later, we were told the earth slowly grew or evolved by meteoric impacts whose energy made the earth molten. This popular story has several problems. First, the rate of temperature increases with depth, called the temperature uh, gradient, varies at different locations by at least a factor of six. In other words, some places it's six times cooler or hotter than it is in other locations. This is true, he says, even when considering only continental rock far away from volcanoes. So even in, in cooler areas, supposedly, there's still a, a great difference. The deep drilling done in Russia and Germany encountered rock so much hotter, they went down further than anybody, Russia especially drilled down, uh, it, it turned out to, that the rock was so much hotter down there than what was expected that each project was terminated earlier than planned. And here's this thing. If the earth has been cooling for billions of years, one would expect very uniform temperature increases with depth at most locations. In other words, everything's settled down. The earth's been around a long time. It's old. It's kind of settled in its ways. He, it goes on, he goes on to say unusually hot or cold regions should not exist because heat diffuses, diffuses from hotter to colder regions, which we all know. You take a hot uh, plate off the stove or a hot pan off the stove, one burner, you put it on the other, that heat will leave the, the uh, pan rather quickly and dissipate into that burner and so forth. So that's sort of the reason for doing that. Had the earth ever been molten, denser materials would have sunk toward the Earth's center, and lighter materials would have floated to the surface. Gravity is going to play a factor as, as things sit there in, in a molten condition, because things can move. One should not find, he says, dense, fairly non-reactive metals, such as gold, at the Earth's surface. It's interesting because uh, the, the uh, book of Genesis and Genesis tap, chapter 2 talks about a place where there's a lot of gold there. The gold there is very fine. It's very, very good, very, very uh, usable. And, and so, you know, it's interesting that he points out gold here at the earth's surface. But they should, it shouldn't be there because it's because of its density. It should have gone way down into the molten areas. Even granite, he says, the basic continental rock, which forms that, that crust, that granite is a mixture of many minerals with varying densities. Okay, if melted granite slowly cooled, a layer cake of vertically sorted minerals would form instead of granite. So Earth's crust was never molten. Earth's crust could never have been molten. If it had been, we'd be seeing something completely different than the mixed-up granite that we find in that crust, which lies right below the surface of the Earth. It would be in layers, and it's not. See, 
the molten earth being molten for billions of years idea cannot explain the formation of granite on the surface of the planet. The planet granite, I guess. I don't know. If such a hot liquid crust was so slowly cooling down over billions of years, its molten state would have caused the material in that crust to sort out in layers by density and weight, with the greatest density material at the bottom, obviously, and lesser dense material layering up to the top. That's why you got to stir your chocolate milk every so often, because things start to settle, right? Th that's the layer cake effect that Dr. Brown was writing about that should be there, but it's, it's not, so the surface was never molten. As he said, that granite that we do see in the crust is a mixture of many minerals with varying densities. So the crust, therefore, was never in a molten state. Looking at this slide, on the surface you can see a blue lake or sea uh, just to the right of center where that yellow arrow that I put in there is pointing. If you look where the red arrow is pointing, you're going to see a thin blue line between the granite crust at the top and the darker basalt mantle beneath the blue line. To get a better idea of what that blue line represents, let's take a closer look yet again. Now there's the blue lake on the surface, okay, or sea, and, and some green mountains dotting the uh, land surface there. Remember, these diagrams represent the pre-flood earth, appearing much as they would have after, right after God created the heavens and the earth and everything on them. As you can see, the blue sky of the earth's atmosphere uh, it has appeared uh, as we've closed in. So you can, the atmosphere is now part of the layers, if you will. Uh, now we'll focus in uh, on what looked like a blue line from the farther away. This feature is the one and only assumption that Dr. Walt Brown makes in his theory. For everything else in his theory to work, Dr. Brown assumes that when God created the earth, that he put water under the crust of the earth in a series of interconnected pockets or chambers. And we'll talk about how that formed a little bit later on this evening. Now, th this can't be proven des definitely from the Bible. It doesn't say, and God made chambers for water, uh, although it sort of says that, as we'll see a little bit later. But there is potential, there's potential textual support for this idea, in other words. Let's, let's take a look at the word firmament as it's used here in Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, you can see the word firmament is used here in this passage five times. Here is what Dr. Brown wrote about this word as it was used in verses 6 through 8. Note, the, the Hebrew word translated as firmament here in the New King James Version is translated as expanse in the um, New American Standard Bible, the Amplified Bible, Holman Christian Standard Bible, and the English Standard Version. So expanse is a word you sometimes will see. And so he talks uh, about that in his notes here. Expanse or firmament, rakia. The key Hebrew word in Genesis 1, 6 to 8 is rakia. I spelled it wrong in the uh, parentheses there. I added a U after Q. It's a habit that I've got. And uh, <laughs> I corrected the other ones, but I missed that one in my proofreading today. The key Hebrew word in Genesis 1, 6 through 8a is rakia. It is translated firmament in the King James Version and expanse in most Hebrew dictionaries and modern translations. While its original meaning is uncertain, its root, raka, means to spread out, beat out, or hammer as one would a malleable metal. It can also mean plate. This may explain why the Greek Septuagint, which is an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, translated rakia 16 out of 17 times with the Greek word stereoma which means a firm or solid structure. 
The Latin Vulgate, uh, AD 382, used the Latin term firmamentum, which also denotes solidness and firmness. So, the King James translators in AD 1611 coined the term firmament. Today, firmament is usually used poetically to mean sky, atmosphere, or heavens. In modern Hebrew, rakia means sky or heavens. However, originally it probably meant something solid or firm that was spread out. So the original meaning of the Hebrew word rakia probably meant a solid and firm object, not heaven, not air. When you think about it, that Latin word firmamentum sounds, well, it sounds firm, right? It sounds solid, not airy, not atmosphere-like, okay? And the root word raka means to spread out. And when I hear that, I think of a blacksmith working at an anvil with his hammer as he flattens out a, a metal blade. Uh, he is raka the metal. He's, in other words, he's spreading out the metal. Raka is a verb, right? He's raka the metal. He's spreading out the metal. That's, that's like metal raka, heavy metal. I don't know. Anyway, so rakia is a solid expanse. It's a solid material that has been spread out. Now, thinking then about something solid that's spread out, Let's look again at verses 6 and 7 in Genesis chapter 1. And, and I'm going to substitute the words spread out solid object for the word firmament here. Then God said, let there be a spread out solid object in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the spread out solid object and divided the waters which were under the spread out solid object from the waters which were above the spread out solid object. And it was so. So like an Oreo cookie, the waters above and the waters below are like the two chocolate cookies, and the rakia, or the spread out solid object, is like the cream filling in between them. And Dr. Brown believes that the rakia, or the firmament, in verses 6 through 8, corresponds to the Earth's crust, including Earth's surface features. There's water above the crust, in the atmosphere above, and in those subterranean chambers there is also water beneath the Earth's crust and surface. However, this can be problematic for the use of firmament in Genesis 1.8. It says, and God called the firmament heaven. Okay, so I, I've often thought Oreo cookies are about as close to heaven as I'll ever get on this side of, 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 of heaven, um, but I don't, you know, that doesn't mean that they are heaven necessarily. I don't know. The firmament is called heaven. That sounds kind of atmosphere -y. That sounds kind of airy, doesn't it? So this is going to be an issue, right? I mean, heaven, um, notice the uppercase H, by the way, in heaven. Heaven is a proper name here. Uh, heaven is, is the sky and the, it's the stars and all of that, right? I mean, that's why he called it that. Well, it all depends on what the word heaven actually means here. I mean, at the time he's creating this, it's only the second day. There's no stars till the fourth day, according to Genesis. All right. Um, what does it actually mean then, this word heaven, in this original creation, pre-flood, and more importantly, pre-fall of man kind of context? We know that verse 1 of this chapter says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now that word heavens... Uh, generally refers to the dwelling place of the heavenly beings, the angels. It also refers to the space where on day number four, God will place the sun, the moon, and the starry host of the universe. It would seem then that the word heaven in verse 8 has some kind of specialized meaning, and I think that's why it's given a capital H. It's, a, it's the name of something specific as opposed to the broader use of the word heavens in verse 1. So you, you can't really say that heaven means the same thing as heavens in verse 1. Heaven in verse 8, not the same thing. You can think about the word in verse 8, heaven, this way. Heaven can also mean where God dwelt. In other words, the original paradise. God walked and talked with Adam. They were together. 
so the original earth was fully under the jurisdiction of heaven. Okay, another way to think of this is this way, that the kingdom of heaven reigned on earth in Eden and on the earth. For God, the king of heaven himself, was in full fellowship with his creation, most especially his human creation, whom he had originally given dominion over the earth. You're going to rule this for me, for my kingdom. It was, after all, paradise. It really was heaven on earth. Oreos don't even come close. However, once man sinned, man could no longer enter the Garden of Eden, the temple of God on earth. You see, the ground of the earth was cursed now. It's not holy ground anymore. Man had relinquished his dominion of the earth to the Nakash, the Hebrew word translated as serpent in chapter 3. Nakash literally means the shining one. And it's often associated with serpentine qualities, such as shining, brightly shining scales, shining in the sun. Uh, there's fiery serpents talked about in the book of Numbers, and, and uh, so forth, that sort of thing. What we have here is a representation, an artistic representation, of what the Nakash may have been like, a bright, shining one in the garden who's tempting uh, them to sin. Revelation 12.9 calls the red dragon in that chapter, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Satan, you see, temporarily has dominion over the earth now. He tempted Christ with all the kingdoms of the world, a legitimate temptation. If Christ would bow down and acknowledge him as God of the earth, he would give him those kingdoms to rule and to reign. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. But in Revelation chapter 5, we see how Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is the only one who can open the seven-sealed scroll, which, as we determined in our series on the book of Revelation, is the title deed to the earth. Once Christ takes his rightful place upon the throne, and he reigns on earth as well as heaven forevermore, then will the kingdom of earth be on earth once, or kingdom of heaven, rather, be on earth once again. So I think calling it heaven is pointing to that kingdom of heaven on earth as it was originally created. All of this, plus other points that could be made, demonstrates that this word firmament, or in some versions expanse in Genesis 1, 6 through 8, could indeed refer to the granite crust of the earth. Uh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, if you look a little further down in Genesis chapter 1, you'll see... Um, uh, the firmament of the heavens used, I think four times down in later verses there that's used, firmament, firmament of the heavens. And that's kind of a phrase that goes together. If firmament meant heaven, or meant heavens, uh, then why would it say heaven of the heavens or heavens of the heavens? That, that makes no sense. It's, it's redundant. And so um, that's not very economical when you've got to save on ink and save on parchment when you're writing. I don't know that they would do that, you know. Uh, it just doesn't make sense anyhow. So um, that's talking about a, sep a different kind of firmament, more that sp uh, space kind of idea. But the firmament in verses 6 through 8, I believe, is this solid ground, this granite crust of the earth possibly, including the surface features of the land spread out throughout the supercontinent and, and beneath the seas that God originally created on the earth. The water above the firmament would therefore be this whole hydrological cycle, including both the surface water there, the oceans, the seas, the lakes, the rivers, etc., and the atmospheric conditions and everything. And the water beneath the firmament would be found in the network of interconnected subterranean chambers that was proposed by Dr. Walt Brown. Thus, the firmament would divide the waters above from the waters beneath. Now, this understanding makes Psalm 33, verses 6 and 7, a very intriguing read. Listen to this. It's talking about creation in this psalm. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the seas together as a heap. 
He lays up the deep in storehouses. Note that this passage deals with the original creation. The deep is laid up in storehouses. That could very well be subterranean water chambers. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it, founded the earth, upon the seas, and established it upon the waters. God's founded the earth upon the seas. Up means on top of. (laughs) Up and on the seas. Underground seas, beneath the earth possibly. He's established the earth upon the waters. Underground water chambers maybe. These these psalms seem to be talking about this. Psalm 136 verses 5 and 6 give reference to Genesis 1.1. Verse 6 of Psalm 136 says this, To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. Now folks, this afternoon as I was preparing this part of the lesson, and I got to this verse that I that I found somebody had in in in, the, in a video that they were using about this subject. Uh, to him who laid out the the earth above the waters. Now I didn't get this from anybody else. When when I looked at that, I saw that verb laid out, and I got really curious. So I looked up the Hebrew word that's translated as laid out there, and guess what? It's the word raka. Remember? Raka, the root word for rakia, the firmament. The same rakia we talked about in Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. Now, the word translated as earth here is eretz, meaning the earth, okay? And that's a common word translated as earth in the Bible. God hammered out the surface of the earth above the waters. That's what it's saying. He hammered them out. He rakiaed them. He rakad them. He, he stretched them out above the waters. God originally put water, therefore, beneath the earth. This verse is telling us straight up. And to me, that sounds like that's what he did. So here's what we have then from this evening's study. Let's just kind of take a look at it in a little bit more detail going back over. Genesis 1, verses 6 and 7, tell us the original design of the earth with this firmament between upper and lower waters. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. If you think of a, of a, of a lake and you've got something in the middle, say a submarine, it's in the midst of the water. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Then God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament all right from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so now here is what that could have looked like from the understanding of the hydroplate theory the surface of the globe was originally covered with water take a look at that circle there of concentric. You got blue above and blue below that brown rakia, right? That brown firmament. Recall that the spirit hovered over the face of the waters. So everything was covered in water at the very beginning. From day two, verses six and seven tell us that the firmament separated the waters above from the waters below it. In the diagram, we see the earth doing just that, that surface thing, the, the um, crust of the earth going all the way around. Uh, it's doing just that very thing all over the planet. And of course, it would be a globe, not a, a two-dimensional circle, obviously. The, the liquid waters, the Hebrew word used for waters, by the way, mayim, can only be used as liquid water. It's not ice. It's not uh, uh, vapor or something like that. Some talk about a vapor canopy and so forth, that that's the water above the earth. Uh, Mayim is only used as liquid water. There are different uh, uh, nouns for ice and and vapor. Uh, The liquid waters were divided in half, with half of the water now being under the firmament, that solid granite structure that was made just for this purpose, to divide the waters. Then on day three... God raised up the supercontinent. 
Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. The rakia was called heaven with a capital H. Now we have earth, capital E, and S capitalized for seas. These are the names of things. And God saw that it was good. Now the firmament was deliberately deformed at this, in this action, as we can see here in this image. Denser portions of the firmament settled onto the underlying mantle in this creative act of God, while lighter portions rose to become the supercontinent, the earth up above. So you can see the waters below are being kind of pinched off by these uh, pillars of rock uh, dropping down from that uh, firmament. The water on the surface filled in those newly formed depressions that happened as a result then. And that's where the seas on, on earth. We can see that Psalm 75 verse 3 in the bottom gray area there says, um, describing these pillars of the earth, the pillars being those weighty depressions of the firmament. It says, it is God who have firm, who, it is I, uh, God, who, has fir who have firmly set it's the earth's pillars, okay? He's set the pillars of earth. And Psalm 33, 7 is repeated for us there. He lays up the deep in storehouses, describing the subterranean water as the deep, and is now kept in storehouses, the chambers that are made by the formation of these pillars, which we see of this ground dropping down kind of thing. By the way, take special note, that only a little bit of the weight of this firmament, or crust, only a little bit of it was being supported by these pillars. It's not like it was needed to do it. It just more or less secured it. It anchored it a little bit, but it wasn't supporting the weight nearly as much uh, as the crust weight being supported by the pressurized water in those chambers. Just think about how highly pressurized that water must have been. All that land mass pushing down upon it like that, and then trapping it. Uh, these are uh, this is water under a great amount of pressure in there. Now the surface of the planet would now look like something like this, if you looked at it from space or whatever. One massive continent of land, which is represented by that goldish brown color there, which would then be dotted by the surface seas, which formed in those surface depressions where the pillars now were. Everywhere you see a, a blue sea or big lake there or whatever, that's where there is uh, the top of a pillar that forms that seabed because it's sunk down there and the waters now lay there, kind of like huge, huge, huge puddles, okay, all over the planet's surface. So that's where things were at the end of creation on day six, at least as far as the, the water and land situation. Notice you could travel pretty much everywhere on earth by land if you, if you chose to. Obviously, there were plant and animal life, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, and human life too, all of it all over the planet. Using the genealogy found in chapter 5 of Genesis, we figure that there was around 1,600 years from the creation of Adam until the time of the flood. All right, I have the flood event circled on that chart with that red oval up there, right by where it says longevity chart, Adam to Joseph. The, the flood where it appears on the timeline, uh, that's where I've got it circled. Uh, the, the exact number of years when you do the math that's found in the genealogies of Genesis 5 is 1,656 years from the creation of Adam. In that amount of time, things got so bad that God had to destroy the earth and, and the, the, uh, the, the humans who lived on it, plus all of the life that we read at the beginning. Anything that had breath on the land died and perished in this flood which came. And it all began on a single day, Genesis 7:11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. All that water, the great deep, 
the storehouses of water. The pressure became so much because of factors that were operating on it, and it burst through uh, up to the surface under high, extremely high supersonic pressure. Uh, absolutely astounding, the destructive force of water uh, coming out of it. It's been said that, that if a, uh, a pinhole were to, bur to somehow form in a crack in a submarine, the pressure of the water from uh, in, a, in a submarine at, at its depth would be enough to slice a man in half. Just that water spraying across there could, could cut a man in half. And I have no reason to doubt that. Water is a powerful force. Pressurized water is powerful. This is hydrological cycles we're talking about there. This is why he's, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, who was a hydrologist in his training, why he called this the, uh, the hydroplate theory. Very fascinating. We'll have much more to say about this in, in the, the weeks ahead. So you, you be sure and keep up with us. Join us. Not sure what next week is going to bring. Uh, we, we may have guests next week, we're supposed to, and maybe uh, my, my friend Jerry Lang will be here. We were going to do that some months ago, back in September, I believe, but it, it wasn't able to happen. So uh, they, they, hopefully they'll, they'll be here next week. I'm not sure if it'll be on Wednesday night yet or not. I'm not sure what the schedule is, but hopefully they'll be here, and uh, we'll have a conversation that night on WOW with Jerry if he's available and, and would like to do that. So I'll keep you informed on, on what's happening. All right. Thank you so much for listening in. I hope this intrigues you and interests you uh, at least half as much as what it does me. Um, this idea I've been intrigued by for years, and it's exciting for me to be able to share some of this information with you. And uh, and even to have discoveries like we had about the Raqqa today, that just uh, kind of rocked my world, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I love it when the Holy Spirit does that kind of thing and shows us new things. And uh, so you got to be kind of a part of that tonight. God bless you folks. You take care, and we'll see you soon.